Well, good evening, and welcome to another exciting evening on the Wisconsin Idea. The materials we've examined, the lectures we've heard, illustrate the power of ideas, the power of visions, because visions represent possibilities. Ideas matter, for they capture images of what already exists and conceptions of what might be. We've been exploring this emphasis, these notions about capturing what exists and what might be in the context of the Wisconsin idea. And for this semester, especially the emphasis of the idea on democracy. Among the analyses, or from the analyses, there's lots of observations that could be made, but there are just a few I want to point to. One of them is that the direction of core ideas can change over time. We've seen this in a number of ways. We've said there's this core idea about democracy, but that hasn't always been approached in exactly the same way by advocates, by people who've thought about the Wisconsin idea. Consider, for example, that there was a very early emphasis of the idea on direct contributions from the university to the state, to the state government. That's declined over time. One explanation for the decline is the state government over time has developed its own offices and bureaus and has had to rely far less than was the case early on on the university. So because of any number of things, there can be changes in the direction of the core ideas, although the idea might remain. We've also learned that there can be conflicts in directions, in interpretations. Consider the lecture from Hess that focused very heavily on political polarization, suggesting not everybody was going to be on the same page. Professor Brighaus noted that the teaching research emphasis has often been a source of dispute or concerns in higher education and, and at this institution. Van der Zanden last week hinted that the connection between research and outreach led E.A. Burge, who was the prominent person there, that Burge did not like the notion of service to the public at all. For him, it was a question of the university investing its resources in research. So we see that there is a necessarily consensus among those who are thinking about directions, they're not always in accord on what can be done. There is also, from these discussions, the conclusion that the larger context matters, that directions that ideas take often gain expression in new forms in different eras. So it's not going to be always linked in the same ways You've read, I'm sure you've read, the Chad Goldberg discussion. And he's reflecting on how developments have expanded the conceptions of who the people are, expanded conceptions of social boundaries. So even though there has been this continuing interest in serving the people, enhancing democracy for the people, it's not always been the case that the people have been thought of in the same way. This observation is particularly apt for tonight's discussion. For the population under discussion, persons diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum, I'm pretty certain that Bascom, La Follette, McCarthy, and others who were strong advocates or having some influence on the Wisconsin idea early on, I don't think they were sitting around thinking about people on the autism spectrum. So this question of how you expand notions of with, for whom are we talking 
Those kinds of things do come up and help explain why the same idea is not necessarily going to be enacted the same way over time. Now, Professor Maynard, who was our speaker for the evening, suggests that this population, those on the autism spectrum, that this population merits attention in any effort to build democracy. And he suggests that attention to this idea promotes, or to this population, promotes the Wisconsin idea. He's, he's bringing to us this evening a discussion that says attention to this population has relevance not only for incorporating all segments of the population, but for addressing a question that's also been fundamental to us, and that is, how can we live together? What are the implications for trying to incorporate all and larger segments of the population? Professor Maynard is a member of the faculty in the Department of Sociology, where he's been for a number of years. But I want to note that his experience away from the campus warrants notice. He took an extended leave for eight years. He was on the faculty at Indiana University, but chose to return to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I found very significant his observation that there is a distinctive culture at this university, and that this culture perhaps reflects the influence of the Wisconsin idea. It's probably someone who has been away, who has not just been enmeshed completely in the university, in this state, who can see what these distinctions are. And for that reason also, we're privileged to have him with us this evening. What we see then is that the, the idea, the Wisconsin idea, has been expressed in different ways over time. The changes do not necessarily mean that the core is no longer there, but it does suggest that the expressions will not necessarily re remain unchanged across time, across populations. Please join me in welcoming Professor Doug Douglas Maynard. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Uh, I want to thank Cora a lot. Um, it couldn't have been a better introduction in the sense of uh, I think what I have to say is going to fit very much with how she prefaced it. So, um, and I just want to express a, a larger uh, thanks to, to Cora because her leadership for this offering of the Wisconsin Idea class has been really exceptional. And um, uh, I've enjoyed it and, and enjoy hearing her. I, I mean, you could just keep going and I could cut my part down. I find it so interesting. Um, <clears throat> So how are we going to wed these two things, the Wisconsin idea and then also autism? Uh, I thought I would start with uh, how the presentation is organized. Um, I'm going to say a little bit, going back to uh, John Bascom and um, the Wisconsin idea and its relationship to, let's say, inclusiveness. Uh, and then I'm going to move to discuss autism as such, and particularly the, the prevalence now, which as I'm sure many of you know has been um, a, a rather gigantic um, upsurge in terms of its uh, prevalence. Uh, and then I'm going to outline what I call a common sense approach to, to autism uh, and introduce my research orientation, which is in a subfield of sociology called ethnomethodology and conversation analysis. Then I'm going to give some examples of the kinds of things that I'm interested in, particularly with relation to the Wisconsin idea uh, from autism, what we call autism autobiography. I mean, people who write their own accounts or they may be written by family members. Um, and then also say a little bit or draw a little bit on my research from autism diagnostic clinics. Um, and then I'll return to autism and more general issues and uh, the Wisconsin idea. So let's go to John Bascom. Um, 
as many of you know, or, and it has been reviewed in here, uh, John Bascom served here at the University of Wisconsin as president from 1874 until 1887. Um, this is from Ho Hovieler's book, uh, which is up here on the, excuse me, on the screen. He observed about um, Bascom that he was a rare kind of individual, a deep thinker, metaphysician, metaphysician theologian, moral philosopher, etc., who brought this cerebral life into the political and social issues of, uh, of his day. And I'm going to draw then on some of Ho uh, excuse me, uh, Bascom's uh, contributions to the Wisconsin idea that preceded the actual uh, evolution and development of the Wisconsin idea. Uh, Bascom, it can be said, was just way ahead of his time. In 1862, uh, he published a paper entitled National Repentance, which was decrying slavery. This was seven months before Lincoln announced his intention for the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1868, he, he wrote about the, uh, the march of the masses, the rank and file, and how their work and living circumstances were not conducive to progress uh, for the social organism. Uh, the social organism is a concept that belongs or fits within um, the Wisconsin ID and is a very important thing, and I may allude to it later on. In 1869, Bascom wrote about women's equality in Putnam's Magazine. In 1872, and then later at the University of Wisconsin here, uh, he was a fierce advocate for admitting women. It didn't get achieved while he was president here but um, he was an ardent supporter of women in the context of academia. So we can say that Bascom clearly was attentive to the disadvantaged and made their situation the critical measure of social progress. And so you can begin to see how it is that autism uh, can fit with this orientation. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to draw um, on Chad Goldberg's excellent introduction about the Wisconsin idea. He's editing a book on this. And as he puts it, the Wisconsin idea refers to the responsibility of the university to serve the needs of the state and its people. However, uh, as he goes on to point out by uh, quoting from or referring to uh, the historian uh, John Bunker, uh, the Wisconsin idea early on ignored several groups in the state that lacked effective organization, um, including women, African Americans, Native Americans, immigrants, um, and uh, the lower socioeconomic orders in general. So I just want to bring this up to date, as Cora was kind of mentioning, to consider, we could say, you know, today what other categories might be important and might have been or might be still excluded from the Wisconsin idea, and we could mention um, Latino, Latina, uh, we've got a sizable Hmong community here in Madison, across the upper Midwest, in fact, LGBTQ. Uh, and then my focus is on disability in general and autism in particular. So um, I also want to connect uh, to a couple of the earlier um, uh, discussions in this group. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Diana Hess was asking the question about how we open the university even more than we have and make sure that different types of people are talking to one another because among other advantages that that has is the way that we learn. Uh -huh. And then, excuse me, um, Harry Brighouse's presentation, uh, I'm going to, um, this is a paraphrase of what he said, but I want to uh, read it out to you. He said something along the lines about how we desperately need more people who are able to think through the positions that others hold, think sympathetically and empathetically, understand the other's arguments, and change their own minds, dealing with difference in a meaningful way. I call this dealing with difference the phenomenon of crossing over the ability to engage in excuse me, deliberation across difference and engage in mind changing. And when we refer to mind changing in the crossing over process, uh, I'm going to say something about who should be changing their mind as this happens. Um, uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about how uh, this phenomenon of crossing over is particularly difficult uh, when you're in close contact with people who are on the autism spectrum. 
And so a question that I'm wanting to raise and to try to answer is, given the difficulties, are there ways that it can be made to happen, this crossing over? And then, if so, and of course you can anticipate, I wouldn't raise this question if I couldn't answer it affirmatively, uh, but if so, what are the lessons uh, for cro about crossing over that could apply to other differences? Um, I, I give a lot of talks on autism, and the first thing people uh, wonder about is this huge upsurge in the prevalence of the phenomenon, and that's not my research area. I know the research, and later on, if you want to know some of the reasons why there's been such an upsurge, we can talk about them. But I just want to, if you can read the chart, you can see how back in 1970, uh, the prevalence was around 1 in 10,000. And the most recent estimate from the CDC, the Centers for De Disease Control, is that uh, the population is about 1 in 59. And if we just talk in sheer numbers, there's about 300,000 individuals across the U.S. who are thought to suffer from uh, autism. You know. Um, I've been teaching about autism for a long time, and it wasn't too long ago, maybe even 10 years ago, certainly 15 years ago, 20 years ago, if I would ask my students, do you know someone or do you have a family member who has autism? And I wouldn't get anybody raising their hand, maybe one or two a smattering. And now when I ask that question, uh, well over the majority are raising, raising their hands. So um, it's just, uh, it's become a more everyday experience than it ever was before. Question, is this an epidemic? Uh, well, a couple of people associated with the university, Paul Shattuck and uh, Maureen Durkin wrote a, an article or an op-ed about this in 2007 in the, two, in the New York Times. And they didn't take a position as such. I mean, whether it's an epidemic depends on how you define epidemics and that kind of thing. And I think they made a really succinct statement when they said, whatever medical puzzle this poses, we have a responsibility to invest in the capacity of our schools, medical centers, and social workers to work with and support affected individuals and families. Uh, I think that's a fine um, uh, definition, or it's certainly compatible with the Wisconsin idea. So now let me tell you about my own approach to uh, autism. I'm calling it experience close because I study interaction. My whole field of inquiry is, is studying audio and video recordings of people, real people talking in real circumstances uh, in a variety of different kinds of circumstances. And um, uh, it's about the social organization of direct interaction. And um, there's, there are always issues about what's the relationship of our close experience to wider social structures. And that's a big question. I'm not going to try to take that on in this talk. I just want to say that we're going to be looking at close relationships and interactions and seeing uh, something about how those are organized. Um, oh, and, um, uh, and so uh, my approach with regard to, to autism, uh, taking, taking an interactional approach, is just that it's behavior that disrupts or breaches common sense. And in, in this respect, we can say that it makes the familiar become strange because it threatens our, this behavior can threaten our notions of common sense, what's right, how to behave, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and those kinds of things. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Temple Grandin. She's uh, written a number of books about her own autism. The most famous one may be Thinking in Pictures. She gives an example. I mean, this idea about the, the, the way in which uh, autism is related to common sense isn't my own idea. She gives an example of a man. Uh, uh, she even names him Ted Hart. And um, he, had, uh, he lived with his uh, parents. And um, he had a way of washing clothes, which was you take your clothes, you put them in the washing machine, you run the washing machine, you put them in the dryer, and then you take them out of the dryer, and then you put them in your dresser. And it so happened that one time the, the dryer uh, went on the blink, but uh, he was so uh, into his routine that he took and he washed the clothes, he put them in the dryer, took them out of the dryer, they're still wet, and he puts them in the dresser. And this is, causes uh, Temple Grand to say he had no common sense. Uh, there's other examples, a really good book about um, Asperger's syndrome, which is now collapsed into the 
uh, autism spectrum is by Tony Atwood, excuse me, and he gives examples like uh, a father asking his son to make a pot of tea, and the son goes and makes a pot of tea, and the father is sitting around and wondering, well, what happened to the tea? And he finally asks his son, well, where's the tea? And he said, it's in the pot. Uh, and so he doesn't get that, you know, the common sense thing is when somebody asks you for, to make some tea that you should then serve it and those kinds of things. <clears throat> um, so now let me uh, uh, transition a little bit to this ethnomethodological uh, uh, perspective that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, what we can say in these examples give uh, some indication of it that it's that when uh, if we want interaction to work, the speaker and recipient uh, in a conversation have to use the same methods of sense making. And I'll give examples of what this means. So, again, my approach to autism is a common sense approach. It derives from this subfield called ethnomethodology. Ethnomethodology was uh, originated in um, the work of a man by the name of Harold Garfinkel. <clears throat> and um, we could just say, in fact, that ethnomethodology is the study of common sense and its use in everyday life. But because it's common sense, as the name implies, uh, it's the kind of thing that is not articulated. It's taken for granted. <coughs> what we know about how the social world should work is at a tacit level, uh, it's at an assumptive level, and uh, so it's hard uh, to examine what it consists of because it is so beneath the surface of things. And so Garfinkel tried to devise these different ways of making it uh, available. And one of, the, one of his uh, devices for doing this was to ask his students to go home and report on common conversations. <laughs> And he said, on one sheet of paper, on the left-hand side, write down what you and your housemates or whoever say to one another. And then on the right side of the sheet, write down what you understand by what you say. And right away you can see that what is understood uh, by what gets said is vastly more than what actually gets said. Um, and uh, I won't go through this, but this is a good, uh, just a little bit. So the husband uh, says to the wife, Dana succeeded in putting a, a penny in a parking meter today without being picked up. And um, what he's conveying and what is understood by uh, his wife is that this afternoon he was bringing their four-year-old to uh, home from nursery school. And um, he uh, was, the four-year-old was able to reach up and put the penny in the parking meter. And this is... Uh, uh, the first time because always before they'd had to pick him up to let him do that. And so she understands this context, but it's all at this tacit common sense level. And uh, so these common sense meanings are much more detailed than what uh, actually gets said. Another device that Garfinkel used for getting at common sense was what uh, he called incongruity or breaching procedures. So another thing he did was to ask his students to insist that a friend or acquaintance just clarify the uh, commonplace remarks that that friend or acquaintance might offer. So, uh, for example, the friend, uh, uh, this, is a, this happens in a carpool. The friend comes up to the student and says, hi, Ray, how is your girlfriend feeling? And um, the student of Garfinkel says, what do you mean, how is she feeling? Do you mean physical or mental? And the friend says, I mean, how is she feeling? What's the matter with you? <laughs> the non-use of common sense is sanctionable. If you don't use your common sense or you don't seem to use it or you don't seem to have it, uh, it's going to get sanctioned. And it makes people very quickly very upset. And there's just a whole series of these examples. It goes from what's wrong with you to are you sick? And it can progress from there to really severe types of consequences. So this matter of common sense knowledge is very, very important. It's very difficult to study. However, with autism, you don't have to go very far. 
to make the familiar strange, to now use a phrase that I want to repeat, um, or to experience incongruity, or to see a breach of what it is that is taken for granted. And as I did in the last slide, in fact, I'm going to color, or I have here color-coded uh, what we could consider to be a breach or a disruption to uh, common sense. And then the red is going to show what uh, or how that gets sanctioned. This is from a very good book. This is what I mean by autism autobiography. A very good book by John Robeson uh, called Look Me in the Eye. He's a man who was diagnosed later in life with Asperger's syndrome and he ended up writing his autobiography. And there's all kinds of stories like this. I'm just going to uh, give you one uh, that describe what it's like to be on the spectrum, so to speak, and what kinds of experiences you might have. So this is about you know when he's uh, maybe 10 years old or something like that, and he's at home, and his mother has invited uh, her friend Betsy over. and. Um, uh, John wanders in, as he says, and um, he hears Betsy say, Did you hear about Eleanor Parker's son? Last Saturday he got hit by a train and killed. He was playing on the train tracks. And John smiles at his words, so there's the breach, and now we get the sanction. She turned to me with a shocked expression. expression. What? Do you think that's funny? He's feeling embarrassed and humiliated, and he starts slinking out of the room, and uh, he can hear her say as he's leaving, what's the matter with that boy? So just the kind of thing that Garfinkel's demonstrations uh, uh, predicted could happen. Now this is um, um, what I call making the familiar strange. So it's to say that common sense has been disrupted here. It's suddenly called into question. Um, uh, Betsy has to wonder, you know, what did I say, or what's wrong, or what's going on here? So that's the making the familiar strange. Now I want to flip this over and say, how can we make the strange become familiar? Well, one of the uses of autism autobiography is that because it's from the point of view of the person with the syndrome, they can often explain how it is that they produce the kinds of behaviors that they produce. And in this case, what John says in recollection is, that he didn't realize, uh, he didn't really know Eleanor, uh, he never met the kid, uh, so there wasn't any real reason to feel either joy or sorrow. Uh, and then he goes through this kind of litany of uh, responses, someone got killed, killed excuse me, uh, it wasn't me, it wasn't my family, um, and then uh, it wasn't any of my friends, um, and then he must have been a pretty dumb kid uh, playing on the train tracks, I would never do such a thing. Uh, I'm glad I'm okay. And so, having these thoughts, uh, he smiles with relief. Whatever killed that kid, he says, was not going to get me. Now, uh, writing this some years later, he says, you know, if this happened again, I would think those same thoughts. But, I would know how to react to them. Or, excuse me, react to the story. Treat it as this was bad news show on his face that he's sad, not glad or happy. So that's what I mean by making the strange become familiar, by investigating the reasoning practices of those who may uh, at first show this anomalous behavior. Now I want to switch to another um, account um, to raise the question that once the familiar becomes strange, how do you cross over to make the strange become familiar? And whose responsibility is it? This is a very good classic book um, called Mar uh, Children's Minds by Margaret Donaldson. And she, um, she recounts in this book uh, a, another uh, uh, autobiography, not by someone who's on the spectrum, but by a man by the name of Laurie Lee. He's a British man who's written a three-volume autobiography. And she takes one of the stories out of the first volume when he's recollecting about going to school uh, in first grade, the very first trip to school. And he goes there and spends the day and he comes home and he's very upset and he walks in the door and he tells his mother, I'm not going back to school, I hate it. And of course she says, well geez, what happened? And he says, I got to school and I walk in and she says, are you Lori Lee? Did I say that that's the name of the 
person who wrote that, are you Lori Lee? And he says, yes. And she said, okay, wait for the present. Sit down. And then she went on with her business. And he says to his mom, I waited all day long, and I never got the present. So, um, what Margaret Donaldson says about this case is that, of course, Lori Lee did not know that the school is not a place where one normally gets presents. That's a bit of common sense knowledge that he didn't have as of yet. But uh, Margaret Donaldson goes on to say, but the teacher did know this. She knew it so well. I mean, this is what it is that's characteristic for common sense. She knew it so well that she didn't even think about it. And she forgot, in a sense, that Lori Lee might not know that you don't get presents at school. Or when somebody uses a phrase like sit down for the present, it doesn't mean you're going to wait for an actual present. So Margaret Donaldson is laying the responsibility on the teacher to have been more recollective about what the situation might be. And one of the things that the autobiography remarks about is how when he's sitting at his desk all day long, he's poking holes in a paper. He's just so, he's waiting for the present and he's frustrated and um, the teacher doesn't even ask, well, what's, what's going on with you? What I want to say about this situation, it illustrates how um, the teacher in this case, I want to call her being the beneficiary of being in a privileged status, and that it's her job to do what Margaret Donaldson calls de-center. That is, to imagine what her words might mean to Lori, the young boy, or to ask Lori what he understands or what's going on with him. So this business about crossing over uh, is, uh, is, is a responsibility, in this case, of the, of the, uh, of the teacher. crossing over from one understanding to another. So now let me say a little bit about my own project on testing for and diagnosing autism spectrum disorder. Uh, this has been a research project funded by the, mostly by the National Science Foundation, but with other sources of funding as well, and particularly with the support of the Waysman Center on campus. And a number of um, students have and postdocs have been involved in this. Um, and um, one of them happens to be here this evening. That's Lucas Wiscons, the one that's on the last on the list there. And he almost has a name that um, sounds like it should be the Wisconsin idea all by itself. Um, uh, so I'm just really grateful for the personnel who have been involved, but also the support I've had. So I'm going to talk both a little bit about testing for autism spectrum disorder and then diagnosing autism spectrum disorder with regard to these issues. First of all, um, the testing part. The idea that I want to convey is that um, testing for ASD can turn up something that we want to call autistic intelligence. Another phrase that we use is concrete competence. That whatever a child's performance in terms of doing well or not doing well on the exam or the test, there are going to be exhibits of, in the interaction that comprises the testing, um, um, phenomena that can only be described as intelligent or competent. So I want to I want to give an illustration about this. And what we're going to do is um, talk about a, a small part of the autism diagnostic and observation schedule. This is the, currently considered to be the gold standard of autism diagnosis. Um, and um, it consists of a number of uh, small tasks to just see how the child uh, works in interaction with the clinician or sometimes with the parents if they're in the room. And there's a lot of toys and things to use as devices for the tasks. We're just going to look at one task. It's called the demonstration task. And this quotation up there is directly from the uh, testing instrument, uh, characterizing what this task is about to see whether the child's ability to communicate uh, can be done by way of gesture as well as language. Uh, and there's a routine task that is set before the child. 
uh, and this is what the clinician is directed to do, to lay out an imaginary sink, hot water, cold water, faucets, etc., and then say, now I want you to show me and tell me how to brush my teeth. Start right at the beginning. Now this is, uh, we can say it's, of course, in the context of a test, but it's a very common sense activity. The example I'm going to go, uh, give you uh, involves a boy who we call Dan. Um, at the time of his evaluation, he was nine years old and two months, and he was in the third grade at school. Um, his pediatrician had referred him to the clinic where we were doing our study for evaluation because of significant behavioral challenges, as it said in the record. Um, and this included a history of aggressive and disruptive behavior at school. Difficult, uh, excuse me, and also difficulty with two-way conversations, although it said that he could talk uh, at, uh, you know, at length about things that he really cared about, and one of these was automobiles and cars. Um, so we've, to some degree, anonymized the, um, the video here, uh, but there's, uh, it's, there's, it, it's in good enough relief, so what I would like you to pay attention to is how uh, Dan, um, in the center here is interacting with the clinician who we call Jennifer. She's a psychologist and uh, uh, she's going to um, use a number of what we call directives telling him to show me how to uh, uh, show me and tell me how to brush my teeth, pretend like I don't know. And um, uh, just pay attention to his, we could call it interactive style. And then I want to make some observations about how he's doing. And what you're going to see is he's not going to do the task that's set before him. Uh, he's just not going to show how to brush your teeth. And he's not going to tell about it either. It's a two-pronged two uh, uh, request of him or directive. Uh, but he's still very attentive in certain kinds of ways. So this is Dan's mother, and she says to him, do you feel done right now? And he then goes and sits down behind the chair. Now, he's there for a little bit, and then he stands up, and then he's coaxed to come back to the table with Jen, and he completes the rest of the ADOS. Um, so now, I want to list uh, just what we might observe by carefully attending to this whole um, episode. And if we had the time, I would ask you for your observations. I'm just going to offer you my observations so we don't spend too much time. But if you do want to throw something <laughs> into my list, you're welcome to do so. Um, one thing we can say, I kind of already anticipated this for you, but he's very attentive with both his, uh, his body is turned to her and his gaze is at her. Another possibility is that he might be Having heard, you know, she starts off by saying this is a, a kind of silly pretend game. Could it be that his resistance may be 
because she's characterized it in such a way. He's nine years old, he's a little uh, you know, young boy, well, you know, why are we going to do this uh, game that you've already called uh, silly? But that's a little bit of spe speculation. What we can further see is that he's producing refusal after refusal where the response slots are. And he does this, we count them 15 different times. So he's skilled in the sense of hearing the directive and knowing where it is to place a response to the directive. It's not just resistive throughout the thing and randomly um, uh, showing uh, uh, negative behavior. He's just consistent and he's also polite. We could also say about him that he knows how to withdraw rather than escalate. And I think this is particularly important because of what's in the medical record about his history of aggressive and disruptive behavior. What are the circumstances, maybe, uh, the, the question could be raised, in which that behavior gets uh, uh, evoked. <clears throat> Here, the, the way in which he's doing the test, and maybe it's the room, who knows, but in any case, he's very um, uh, consistent and polite with his refusal behavior here. He also knows where he can be safe within the room. He knows to go over not to some other corner in the room. He goes over to where his mother is and where there's a chair that he can crouch behind. Um, there's another thing that happens. You may have heard that when she, now I, I want to emphasize, she is doing exactly what the script tells her to do. She is administering this uh, subtask the way it's supposed to be done. And when a, a child at first does not comply with the directives to show me and tell me how you brush your teeth, then the clinician is told in the booklet, then you show him give a demonstration yourself, and it could be about how to drive a car. Uh, but when she enters this, um, you, you, may, you probably wouldn't have noticed this. We noticed it after many, many viewings. His strongest negative head shake is when she says, I'll show you how to drive a car. And he just goes like this. And then he says, I already know how to learn to drive. And she says, you do? And, he's, and then he goes like this. And it's the only positive head shake in the whole time. Now, there's an issue here of could she have stopped things and asked him about cars or could you show me how to drive or learn to drive a car or what have you? And I don't want to take the time to discuss that further. I just want to notice that there's something very important there and it's along the lines of indicating or indexing his competence and his uh, what we're calling autistic intelligence. Um, I just put a reference up there because if you want to read more about this, I, I do have a publication on this. So now we go to the part where the test having been completed, they're going to diagnose Dan. And now um, the person on your left is the developmental pediatrician. Uh, there in, in the clinic where we were, there were several developmental pediatricians. This is a relatively new specialty that is for uh, uh, working with children who are on the spectrum and uh, with other kinds of uh, developmental disabilities. So she's over here. And on the right-hand side is Jennifer, the psychologist that we saw working with Dan. The third person in the middle is an intern, and she's not taking part in this interaction. She's just observing, more or less. Um, I'm going to play this for you, but um, so I do conversation analysis. And one of the things about our transcripts is that they're very detailed. I'm not going to take the time to go through all the details, but I want to read the beginning of this because it's a little bit muffled. Um, so they've gathered uh, to talk about their respective exams. The developmental pediatrician has done quite a long interview in her own right, including a traditional physical exam. And she says uh, and to Jennifer, and, and what are your thoughts? Or what, what did you find with your testing? And Jennifer says, uh, I think, I mean, I think an a, a ASD diagnosis fits. These brackets here indicate where there's overlapping talk. So just as she says fits, uh, uh, the Leah, we call the developmental pediatrician Leah, uh, says it's appropriate, yeah. So she's aligning to this characterization and she's also, this is what we call a go ahead, it allows uh, Jennifer to continue with uh, the diagnostic part. And, and what are your thoughts, or what, do you, what did you find with your testing? I think uh, I so, so he So um, he actually came up a little higher on the ADOS than I thought he would, just because he did so many nice 
things. Like, oh, he was very polite and responsive. And um, anyway, so so he came up with a thirteen um, and then cut off his own. So he was um, in that range. There was one point where he shut down briefly, and Mom said actually that that he was like completely done. For the, like she kind of made that gesture <laughs> to me, uh, but he came back. And so now here's that same transcript with a little more spacing. Uh, I want to show you how we analyze this uh, diagnostic dialogue between the pediatrician and the psychologist. Uh, we take what we call a narrative approach to diagnosis. And um, it's to say that the diagnostic process is a storytelling process. It's one in which the clinicians share stories about what they've learned about this child. Mostly in a clinic, it's about how the child, it's stories about how the child performed on a test. It can be reported um, behaviors that the school may have told them and other kinds of things, but it's mostly reports about how the child performed on the test. So to say that this is a storytelling or narrative enterprise, it's not that they're making these things up. It couldn't be other than that they have to tell you know, about their results through this narrative process. So that starts with what we call a prefacing upshot. And in this case, uh, this upshot is actually the, uh, uses the diagnostic term itself when Leah, excuse me, uh, Jen says, I think, I think an uh, ASD diagnosis fits. And then this go ahead has uh, Leah aligning to that characterization, um, uh, uh, agreeing that it's appropriate. And so Jen goes on to say, um, uh, he actually came up a little higher on the ADOS than I thought he would just because he did so many nice things, like he was very polite and responsive. We call this a tendency story, and we have carefully codified how to uh, see or spot uh, these um, tendency stories. Basically, in some way, they represent a quantification of the child's behavior. Um, I could give you more examples, but and again, in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief about this. Uh, this has an interesting feature in that she talks about the surprise of his being so, um, doing so many nice things and being polite and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, so these, these tendency stories, uh, however, uh, let me put it this way, those observations are sandwiched between the him coming up higher on that ADOS um, and then um, where she says, so he came up with a 13 and a cutoff was a 9. So she's quantifying how it is that they, uh, she can suggest that it's a, a child who has the diagnosis of ASD. In the midst of this uh, telling the tendency story, we get the what we call recipiency display on the part of the pediatrician when she says, oh, good. But it's also approval. It's a green. And then uh, we get a final upshot. Um, he was solidly in that range. So the preface and the upshot match one another, and that's usually the way these um, diagnostic uh, narratives go. Following the upshot, we get what we call an instantiation story. This happens to be what Lucas Wiscons is studying. Um, uh, and the difference between tendency stories, or a tendency story and an instantiation story, is that where tendency stories are literally talking about what a child tends to do, which is part of how we get it, this is quantifying the child's behavior, instantiation stories, as the name might imply, are about what a child does one time, at a particular time, and at a particular place. They're very, very concrete. And what she's referring to here is exactly what you saw, which is that there was a point where he shut down briefly, and mom said that he was completely done. She used this gesture, and you may have seen that. It was in the, it was in the video. And um, so this is about just that. It wasn't about what he tends to do. It was about that one example. <clears throat> Now, I want to go back to the observations that I offered you about his performance during the demonstration task. And we have all these other things that could be said. 
Sometimes clinicians do make these kinds of concrete observations about these instantiations that they report on, or sometimes it's parents who also tell stories like this. Um, uh, but a lot of times the clinicians, as we have in this case, this stuff gets uh, left out in the diagnostic process. It's often not referred to. It is sometimes, but by and large it gets left out. Well, does that matter? We're making the case that it does matter. So why are they important? Why are these instantiation stories important? One reason is they provide a picture of what a child can do concretely, not in terms of his tendencies or not in terms of what he typically does, so that then we can say that they individualize the child. They provide a means of knowing this child and not the generic child with autism. The tendency stories align with what the definition of autism is in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and those are deficit definitions. In some senses, the, I didn't want to take time for this also, but the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for autism is a list of deficits. And that's what tendency stories are. They, they document the deficits. It has to be that way if you're going to do diagnosis. But these instantiation stories give a different picture of the child. They show what his competences are or what his autistic intelligence may be. So in a, in a way, we can say that they make this strange. You know, in some senses, Dan's behavior, refusal to do this, what we could say is a common sense, just, you know, show me how you brush your teeth. Um, so they make um, uh, the, the, the instantiation stories, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. So uh, his performance makes the familiar become strange because he's not doing what seems to be just a common sense task. Instantiation stories flip the coin because by closely attending to, to what he's doing, we can see that what initially appears to be strange is more familiar, that he's doing recognizably competent uh, kinds of behaviors. That means then that these are the kinds of things that for those who are going to work with this child, they can build upon these things. Well, how do we do this? And when I say we, this is where I want to come back to this notion that I brought up with regard to Margaret Donaldson and Lori Lee. What I mean by we is to refer to the beneficiaries of the, the, uh, those who are the beneficiaries of occupying a privileged status. In the case of autism, we're talking about the common sense actor in certain kinds of ways to be a common sense actor is to occupy uh, a certain kind of status that is privileged just because it's common. If you're a common sense actor, if you're, you know, the term is used neurotypical, uh, you're in uh, an advantaged state. And the person who is not a participant in common sense ways of acting is in a disadvantaged state. So what do you do? I don't know how many of you have heard of this book. Uh, it's by our uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor. Yes. Uh, she has a book called Just Ask. And you may have heard her on NPR. She was interviewed about this book. She got spurred to write this book because she happens to be a person who has type 1 diabetes, diagnosed from a very early age. and. Um, She's a person who therefore has to give herself insulin shots before a meal. And she tells of her experience of going in, being in a restaurant, and she's getting ready, she, she's made her, she's done her ordering, she's, she goes in the restroom to take a, an injection of insulin. And as she's doing this, another woman comes in the restroom and sees her take this injection. So uh, Sonia Sotomayor leaves, goes back, has her meal, and as she's leaving the restaurant, she hears this woman say to her companion, uh, she's a drug addict. And Sonia Sotomayor stops, turns around, and says, 
Madam, I am not a drug addict. I am a diabetic, and that injection you saw me give to myself is insulin. It's the medicine that keeps me alive. If you don't know why somebody's doing something, just ask them. Don't assume the worst in people. And so these books are about children. It's, they're, they're, they're children's books, and uh, children with all kinds of differences. Some, you know, there's a child who's not hearing, another one who's blind, one who has autism, one who has Tourette syndrome, and so forth. And she's just advocating, you have a right to be who you are. And if somebody is bothered by you, have them, tell them to ask you about your situation. So I think it's just a wonderful metaphor for how to uh, make the crossing from one set of ideas to others that seem so uh, awry relative to our own. That is to say, learning how to ask can make the strange familiar. So we're going to go back to uh, uh, John Robeson, and I'm just going to make this up. But let's say, instead of things happening the way they happened, where uh, Betsy uh, confronts him and is shocked and so forth, uh, she does something different. What if instead of being shocked and uh, asking, you know, what do you think? And you think that's funny? And what's the matter with you? Uh, what if she had said, John, I see that you're smiling. Most of us would show a sad face. Can I ask what makes you smile? And then she might have made the strange become more familiar. Because when you go through this stuff, you can say like, oh, well, well that makes sense. And maybe it's an opportunity to teach him. You know, most people in this kind of situation would do this differently. And how, here's how you might want to think about doing this in the future. I'm going to give one last example and then wrap up. This is from a very good book by Andrew Solomon called Far From the Tree. I don't know if anybody in here, anybody read this book besides me? It's a long book. It has uh, 12 chapters that are about children who, uh, using that familiar phrase, instead of falling, falling close to the tree of their parents' characteristics, they fall far from the tree because they have some kind of disability or some kind of experience that's very different from the parents. They may have, uh, they may have no hearing, and these are hearing parents. Uh, or they might, you know, there's, there's 12 different kinds of differences that he explores, and one of them is um, autism. And so this is just a little vignette where uh, Andrew Solomon uh, interviewed this family. Ben was a teenager at the time. He had rather severe autism. Uh, Bob and Sue, the parents, take him to Radio Shack, uh, his, you know, it's, as it says, his favorite store. But in getting there, he, he panics on the escalator. And at the bottom, he sits down cross-legged, and he starts smashing himself in the head with his hands and screaming. Now, uh, according to my color coding, so this is the breach of you know, common sense and how it is that people are supposed to perform when they're in a public place like this. So we get this sanctioning exhibited in the crowd that begins to gather. Sue has this keyboard. She knows her son. And uh, when she took, takes it out, Ben types, hit me. And she's thinking to herself, oh yeah, in the middle of a mall with a security guard. Now, um, you know, she could have asked for help from the security guard. Um, but as she's thinking, uh, he goes on to say, like a record player. And this allows her to flash on a stuck needle. Or it makes me think of, um, in my generation, we had these pinball machines. And when they got stuck, um, uh, you would, um, they would literally say tilt, and you would nudge them to get them off and back to work. In any case, she strikes him on the edge of the shoulder with the heel of her hand and says, tilt. And Ben stands up and walks calmly across the mall. So um, what we can see again is the exhibit of concrete competence and um, appreciation of that competence and intelligence by his mother, who's smart enough to carry a device around with her to help him spell things out, and also to take the time to allow things to process and think things through so that she can react to him in a way that's drawing on 
uh, the competence that he's actually exhibiting. So, back to the themes, making the familiar strange. Children and others on the autism spectrum often seem to violate common sense. They make the familiar seem strange. Violated behaviors initially taken as signs of disability or deficit are often methodic. They're intelligent, they're competent in their own right and can be seen that way. So, to make the strange become familiar, it means crossing over, it means asking questions, making observations that are not challenging or judgmental, but enable the seeming breacher or violator whose knowledge and experience is different to be appreciated. If this can be done with individuals with autism, or for individuals with autism, so also can it be done with those whose identities seem to be other. Just as there is, let's call it neurotypical common sense, so is there racial, gender, sexual orientation, and other forms of common sense. Asking questions, making careful observations to make the strange familiar is the job of those who are beneficiaries of privileged statuses. So it's not just like you know, uh, a two-way street. It's crossing over from, the, uh, in the case of autism, the neurotypical point of view, but in other cases, the taken for granted common sense with regard to whether it's race or gender or what have you, to make observations and uh, query the person about their experience. The Wisconsin Idea and Autism. Uh, this is from uh, another very good book about autism. is by uh, Roy Richard Grinker, an anthropologist who has a, uh, a daughter who's on the spectrum and wrote this great book. Um, and he says, what if the power of the term epidemic, if you want to call this an, an epidemic, is in how the newer, higher, more accurate statistics of, on autism are a sign that we are finally seeing and appreciating a kind of human difference that we once turned away from. The Wisconsin idea presupposes and implies that what Bunker calls a commonwealth model of society. This is the organic society. Again, the Wisconsin idea presupposes and implies a commonwealth model of society or an organic society. Drawing on the language of social bonds, this model posits a definable public interest of collective good that is greater than the sum of the individual private interests, one that transcends all of these particular concerns and that can best be achieved through enlightened cooperation. And that's drawing also on Chad Goldberg's very good chapter. I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there are questions and observations from the audience. And it's quite clear that this has profound implications for things that we have already covered and will be covering during the entire semester. I couldn't help but think about what happens as there are attempts at institutions to diversify. But what does diversification mean? It means trying to have people in who are going to be, who are not acting strange of that the Temple Grandin example uh, drawn on. It was amazing that once they could discover the great talents that she had, or had and has, that building on those kinds of talents have implications far beyond what we sometimes think about. Or I think of the president of a very distinguished institution, his colleagues kept saying, well, he's, a, he's a strange person. Well, it turns out, I said later, he was probably on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, but So it doesn't mean that everybody's going to be identical. And being able to build on those kinds of strengths, on the distinctiveness then, I think is a, something we will be taking away from this lecture and being very careful about making assumptions about how everybody must be and what common sense actually means. Thank you so much, but let me see what comments, questions. All right. <laughs>
Greta Thunberg has uh, said that one of the things that gives her powers is her autism. Uh, I think it's she sees herself as having uncommon sense rather than common sense, and uh, in a world that uh, where common sense hasn't uh, served us too well. I was wondering if you see have seen other people with autism who who see themselves in the same way that Greta does. Oh well, there's many. There are actually many, and um, but let me follow up on the Greta Thunberg. One of the really interesting parts of that story to me is about her mother because Greta you know, didn't like the, and doesn't like flying on airplanes because of the, uh, the fumes that are being sent into the atmosphere. And she's talked to her mother and convinced her mother we were going to go on boats. And her mother is an opera singer. And you know, this is you know, s slowing down the time to get to a site to perform opera. It's, it's another example of this mother that we just looked at you know, dealing with uh, her son on the escalator. The adjustment that parents can make is doing the, a kind of thing that I'm talking about, which is um, working with someone who, whose behaviors are threatening to our usual way of doing things uh, and making adjustments because of their reasoning. And, and uh, uh, so, anyways, so I think there's, I just wanted to point, that other, point out that other part of that story. Uh, but yes, there's many, many. Um, um, I wish I, I had, uh, Temple Grandin, Temple Grandin has this uh, point where she says, like, you know, if you went back to the cavemen, the people who would be out there, you know, grinding, you know, for hours on stones and uh, rubbing pieces of metal together, they're the ones that are going to be inventing the wheel and the, you know, whatever, and they're the ones that probably were on the spectrum at the time. Um, but and there's many, many of our. Um, public figures, uh, successful public figures who, you know, from everybody from Einstein to Bill Gates who have been retrospectively discussed as having uh, autism spectrum disorder. So, uh, I mean, it's another interesting aspect of the whole upsurge of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, now we know how prevalent this uh, difference is in the society and um, we probably have um, only a limited understanding of uh, how many individuals are making huge contributions, and they're making huge contributions because of uh, this quality that they share. <clears throat> Thanks. I'm wondering if you could go back one slide. Um, OK, back one more slide. <laughs> So somewhere I saw this where you were, and, and it's okay. It's, well, it, we can keep going until we. Well, find it was it. where you had, uh, you know, about race and gender and GLBTQ and. It's right there. This this so point it is, here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. Good. Um, so the thing that strikes me the most from what you're talking about, and that then you capture here as you you try to connect this with the Wisconsin idea, is that maybe. Uh, we make a big mistake when we talk about um, those who have common sense and those who have autism, i.e. sort of zero, one. Um, and it probably all is a spectrum. And, you know, w w one out of 59, the, so the other 58 have what we might call common sense. But I expect all of those people are, are quite different as well, mm -hmm. um, and that more or less able to connect, and that we're seeing one extreme and, and calling it something. The same thing with uh, race, gender, sexual orientation. Um, it's, it's generally not sort of zero or one. It's, it's not it's just two things. There mm -hmm. is a range. Mm -hmm. So in view of that, I, I like that you connected this with what some of the other speakers have talked about. Um, where we're really trying to get to understand people. And if you could generalize from this, from what you see in autism, um, and talk about kind of lessons for understanding, again, not just when we deal with somebody who's been, who's a 13 and the 9 is a cutoff, but what about the 10s and the 4s and, the, you know, um, really what does this, this study of yours tell us about how we might want to communicate just with anybody, 
That's a great question, and I've, I've actually had that question before. And I have to say, um, we've been working on this autism stuff, and we were wanting to get precise about what we mean with regard to autism. We want to nail down um, the testing and diagnostic process, sociologically speaking, uh, for autism. And one of the next projects, in fact, that I'm working with colleagues uh, here and also um, someone who happens to be at the University of California in San Francisco, but is a, an expert on the ADOS. As we've been working, we've been wondering, like, what could, the, is, would anybody who does the design of these tests, would they be open to some of our observations? Well, I was able to, we've been able to find some people who are. And, we're, and um, so a next phase of our research is about how can the ADOS be administered in such a way to deal with the individuality of the child who is getting diagnosed. Yes, we want to know, does the child, you know, autism is going away, autism diagnosis is not going away, but can we make it a better process that deals with the individual child? And that's a challenge in its own right. Um, I certainly think that this applies to other areas, but I don't have much more to say about them other than what I've said here. I think that, but you can think about such things as um, heteronormativity, for example, is, a, is, the, uh, is those who are heteronormative and, um, or participate in heteronormativity by virtue of their sexual orientation occupy a privileged status. And the question is, can these people relate to people who don't occupy that status? And the argument from, our, from this is that it's their job. It's not the job of the person who's non-heteronormative to come at the other person. Um, and I was trying to think about this in relation to um, uh, our, the earlier speakers uh, that I mentioned, uh, 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 Diana and, um, um, and, yeah, and Brighouse. Because uh, they, they're, they're talking about speaking across category memberships or identities, if you want to put it that way. But there's this problem embedded there as to who is it that is to do the reaching out. And I think both of them implied, I think certainly Brighouse was implying that um, a job of the university is to teach individuals how to learn about differences by going into, to, by making this crossing, crossing over into the unfamiliarity of another person's world and orientation. And I just think that it's not, it's not, we're not on equal terrain when we're wanting to do this. That there are people who occupy privileged statuses and are often beneficiaries. The reason I put it that they're beneficiaries of a privileged status is that just because you belong to a privileged status doesn't mean that you're always a, a beneficiary of it. So I want to just be more precise about talking about privilege, but it's along those lines. Hi. Um, so just kind of thinking back to 1970 and how far we have come um, with the increased prevalence of diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder um, has come also an increased awareness in our society. And I think that that has had significant advantages and has been really wonderful in a lot of ways. But at what point do you think that there has also been a recent decline in the information that people are actually receiving um, in our society when the prevalence is so high that people are quick to assume that someone that is not normal is automatically on the spectrum? And how would you deal with that moving forward? Um, well, I, I'm very close to autism and autism diagnosis, and I didn't mention, but I can mention that uh, we have a son who was diagnosed with um, what was then called high-functioning autism in fifth grade. So I have a parental viewpoint and have gone through the diagnostic process with our son. And then we've done it. We have uh, 50 cases, which is a lot of video recordings, let me tell you, for the kind of research I do. 30 of the 50 cases uh, are uh, resulted in a diagnosis of autism in this sample that we have. Uh, but I, I refrain, it's, it's, so I know a lot about autism diagnosis from a researcher's point of view and from a parental point of view, 
but I refrain from diagnosing my colleagues and uh, other people, uh, even though some people come to me and say, like, do you think so-and-so is autistic? And I just, I, I just, I just want to go there. Um, I, you know, if you know, I think it's a, it's a danger, you know. But it's, it's like when we get these labels, you know, they get a, people want to use them when they're not necessarily equipped to be able to do that. Um, so I, I'm familiar with Temple Grandin and uh, went to grad school with her and she's in the meat industry, I'm in the meat industry, and et cetera, et cetera. Wow. And I was wondering, um, you used the word epidemic and a, um, a syndrome and those kinds of things. Uh, should we be interested or are we working at, should we be working at curing autism or embracing Autism. Well, my own view is that we should be embracing it. Um, I don't think that a cure is even, uh, it's not in the, it's certainly not in the in close proximity. I mean, this, this brings us into the area of the biology and genetics and uh, brain functioning and those kinds of things. And, you know, um, I think uh, probably you know or many people know, there is no gene for autism. It seemed to be multigenic, and it's a very complicated disorder from a genetic point of view. And um, uh, the, the, the inroads that have been made have been uh, minuscule in terms of identifying genes. There are genes that are identified with autism, but the amount of, or the kind of autism that they may explain is very, very limited. And, um, um, and you know, we need a lot more knowledge about um, uh, many, many different kinds of genes and um, the relationship of um, the environment uh, to the genetic uh, makeup of an individual and those kinds of things. So I don't know if that answers your question. It sort of does. Yeah. It really wasn't uh, an answerable question, I, not here. Um, it might not be related to genetics at all. Might it be related to biofunctional nutrients? Oh, uh, well, I think that um, um, my knowledge of that is there's nothing that's been identified there, just like, um, you know, there's, there's, there's been many, many different theories. There's the vaccine theory and those kinds of things, and nothing uh, along any of those lines has ever been demonstrated, at least to my satisfaction, although I'm not an expert in those areas, uh, that they have an explanatory um, uh, causal uh, effect on uh, the presence of autism in individuals. That would have to be our last question. Thanks very much for it. Please again, join me in 